Is that on? There we go. All right, fluid controversies. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about fluids in a, diff, in a couple different venues. Mostly the literature is gonna focus on trauma, and that's where probably most of the issues are. I would say that if you just ask the most emergency physicians sort of what their approach is to fluids, there are some sort of very pragmatic things that would represent most emergency physicians use most of the time, which represents sort of three decades of work, which is this. All IVs are either off or wide open. If they're gonna be wide open, please say how much. This concept of Q or per hour, I tell our residents that if you're writing for anything with a Q, you know, something Q8 or anything per hour, you're not working in the emergency room. You are now an internal medicine resident. You know, it, it, they either need it or they don't. And the fluid that's used all the time is normal saline with the exception of burns. Otherwise, they get normal saline. At least for the first two liters, they're getting normal saline, or for at least for the first 40 per kilo. And that, by and large, you don't need a central line. You can do this via peripheral lines and, and certainly be adequate with, with your recess needs. And so that's kind of how our sort of angst and sort of approach towards this has been over the last three years. The question that we're going to try and ask and answer in the next couple of minutes is, is there anything really to challenge that approach? Do we need to change that? Is there, is there literature that would suggest that we should be doing something different? And, and then as a secondary question, because it comes up in trauma all the time, Rick asked me when I did this to look at ATLS and what ATLS says. Now, ATLS is quite out of step with us because ATLS wants you to use a lot of central lines and they want you to use lactated ringers all the time. Um, and they push about that. In fact, we even have these petty little academic battles at our institution where they'll come down and they'll, they actually used to refer to any IV started in the emergency department as enemy lines. <laughs> Please pull the enemy lines. They would tell their interns in front of us, pull the enemy lines when you get them to the ward. And, um, and they would put lactated ringers up on them. Now, lactated ringers is a problem and lactated ringers probably shouldn't be used as the fluid of choice. And the first four abstracts, one, two, three, and four, all point out that one of the things I've noticed with trauma patients is that occasionally they're bleeding. And that when there's bleeding, especially if there's a lot of it, then they might need blood. And lactators ringers just isn't compatible with blood. You shouldn't be giving it with it. It causes microaggregate formation. It clogs the Paul filters. It causes ARDS. It accelerates apoptosis of your gut lining and things. And so it's just not compatible. And so abstract one talks about this and against, advises against it. In fact, the American Blood Banking Association, not that the American College of Surgeons would listen to them, but the American Blood Banking Association says that lactated ringers is incompatible with blood and that just taking the lactated ringers down and putting up normal saline isn't good enough because the lactated ringers is stuck to the tube because of the laminar flow, and it continues to cause clotting for some 30 minutes after, even if you change the lines over. So you'd have to take the whole thing over and start at the beginning at the poking site if you were going to change over. Abstract 2 talks about incompatibility, often unrecognized. Abstract 3 from Yale talks about microaggregates. Abstract 4 talks about microemboli. Uh, and they, they actually, they, in abstract four, they did a funky thing. They actually took an electron microscope and they looked at the filters when they ran lactated ringers as opposed to normal saline. And when they looked at it with an electron microscope, you could tell which one was the lactated ringers line because there was a, you know, a spider web of fibrin all stuck to it whenever you ran it through. So there's, it's pretty clear. And then there's another paper that I part, provided a reference for in there that says that in addition to that, your gut linings and your, and your lung linings and everything else just dies with lactated ringers. So lactated ringers is a problem and ATLS is a little bit out of step. Now who else shouldn't get lactated ringers? Anyone with a head injury. Why so? Because lactated ringers is hypotonic, slightly only, but here's what happens when you have an edematous forming lesion in the head and you give someone two liters of lactated ringer. And then there's this noise that sounds like this. That's when something slips out the frame and magnum that shouldn't. <laughs> And you can only make that noise once. Um, and so you should never give lactated ringers to someone with a head injury. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if motor vehicle accidents are what you're managing most, a lot of them are bonked on the head, so they shouldn't be given lactated ringers. A lot of them might need blood because they have a ruptured spleen, so they shouldn't be given lactated ringers. And if you're in a low-tech environment where you don't have a level one or a rapid infuser, that means how are you going to heat your fluids? In a microwave, how do we know you have a microwave? Because you have nurses, and you can never have a nurse more than 50 yards away from a microwave. They have to be within proximity to each other. So you're gonna microwave, 
your stuff. And you can't microwave lactated ringers because it caramelizes. It doesn't really flow very well when you make candied apples out of your lactated ringers, and so you shouldn't do that. Um, and so there are lots of reasons why you shouldn't use lactated ringers. And finally is that there's a small incremental cost increase with lactated ringers that just isn't necessary. So normal saline is where it's at. The next group of papers deal with this. How many of you have heard about this controlled hypotension, permissive hypotension, delayed resuscitation thing? Okay, so there's, this is a big talk. Now, a lot of people are actually putting this into play. ATLS did not. They talked about it. They said they were going to do it. But in the most recent edition of ATLS, they decided this was too confusing for the ATLS student to master. And so we're just going to leave it out. So what I provided for you here is the information on it so you can decide if you want to play with this. It has some problems. It has some pluses. The concept basically goes like this. You have a hole in a big red vessel. We're presuming it's red. And that hole leaks a lot of red stuff. And the higher you make the blood pressure, the more it leaks. And that leaking process actually destabilizes the clot at the hole and dilutes the coagulation factors and makes it harder for you to stop bleeding. So you're just going to die more. Now, this is probably only true if the hole is in a big red artery. It is not true if it's in smaller circulation because if you have a small arteriolar injury, the main mechanism for controlled bleeding is spasm, not wound geometry and clot formation. So it's probably true for the aorta. It's probably true for the thoracic vessels. But beyond that, we don't know if it's true. And so here's the papers. Five is the first paper, the swine aortotomy model by Susan Stern and others where they have the Goldilocks phenomenon. And basically what they do is they sew a wire two inches long into the aorta of a pig, and then they externalize the wire, and they heal the pig, and the pig runs, roots around, and everyone's happy. Then they put the pig to sleep, and they grab the wire, and they go, mm. And so we're pretty sure what the hole is. We know exactly what the hole is. And then they look at different resus regimens. And when they resus the pigs to a mean arterial pressure of 40, that was too low. They got organ failure. When they resussed them, the pig to a mean arterial pressure of 80, that was too high. They all bled too much. And when they resussed the pig to a mean arterial pressure of 60, that was just right. And Goldilocks did fine. The pigs lived longer. They, had, they did better. Now, just to put this in perspective for you, you've got to recognize that pigs are healthier than humans. They have lower mean arterial pressures. So the equivalent pressures in humans for those are 60, 80, and 100. So they would say, resuscitate people to a map of 80 and stop. Because after 80, they just shed more blood and do worse. Abstract 6 looks at the same thing. Abstract 7 looks at it in rats and found out that this is true. And then we have the human literature, which is 8, the one that everyone talks about, which is by Bickel in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they said, we're going to have a no resuscitation group in the field. We know you've been shot. We're just not giving you any fluids. Come on in. And we're going to have a resuscitation group, and we're going to look at how they do. And the concept was that the delayed resus group should do better because they're going to have these big red arterial injuries, and they're going to not be resuscitated. And in fact, they had a little bit better outcomes in the delayed resuscitation group. But the problem is, if you look at that study really carefully, there are five patients that were dropped from one of the study groups. And if they had been included, as they should have been in an intention to treat analysis, the statistical significance would disappear. And the second problem with that study is no one says that resuscitating people doesn't raise their blood pressure. We know it does. That's what causes the more bleeding. But the two groups had the same blood pressure on arrival to the OR. So there's some question about whether or not this really was right. And so I find that data soft, although it's often advocated as the way to go. Abstract 9 is another Houston paper that says that when you over-resuscitate people, they also get more multi-organ failure and they get coagulopathy. And Abstract 10 is a funny paper that says if you give people 10 liters of fluid, they do bad. Thanks. I needed to. I call that drowning. Um, uh, but anyway. And then there's an 11 is a British review, which is kind of a summary, which agrees with those. And, and 12 thir through 16, just look at whether or not this should be integrated into the pre-hospital care setting. My feeling about this is how, do you, how are you going to distill this in? My feeling is that if you think there's a high likelihood of a large vessel injury, I would go with it. So in our system in Los Angeles, we say if they have penetrating trauma to the chest, we will hold off on large volumes of fluid in the field. If we think they have an aortic injury, we will hold off. And then we'll, we'll kind of play this delayed or moderately hypotensive resus game. Now, the other way you can use this is when you're resuscitating someone and their blood pressure is responding, perhaps you could back off a little sooner. So in the old days, you'd resuscitate someone, their pressure was coming up. It's 90, it's 100, 100. You say, oh, slow those fluids down. 
Now maybe you ought to say that a little earlier. In other words, if there are a responder, ATLS describes three people, three groups of people in trauma. There's the group that doesn't respond to fluid challenges at all, you know, so really severe hypotensive shock situation. The group that re responds to the first two leaders and stays good, the quote unquote responder, and then the middle group, which is the group we're really talking about here, which is the transient responder, responds and then gets hypotensive again. And their point is, is that if they're responding, maybe you should give a little less fluid, just kind of back off when their map is looking like 70, 80. Now, abstract 18 is the paper that talks about um, this concept of wound geometry a little bit, and there's some things about it. And there's one other important caveat with penetrating chest and no resus. So if you got stabbed in the chest and you weren't gonna be resuscitated, there's one group of patients that isn't gonna do well. And who are they? The people with tamponade. So if you got stabbed in the chest and tamponade is what you have, the problem is, is that tamponade is an absolutely 100% preload dependent condition. If I don't overcome the filling obstruction of your right ventricle, you're gonna die in the field. Now, tamponade, for those of us who work in trauma centers like I do, we love tamponade, and we especially love tamponade due to stab wounds because it's a very viable condition. I love it. You come in with a stab wound right next to your sternum with neck veins out like this, I love those patients. We will crack you open, free that tamponade, staple your heart, play the Foley game, and that's where we get almost all of our survivors from thoracotomy. And so the concept, the question that I want to get out that's never been answered anywhere in the literature is if we're really going to do the hypotensive or delayed resus on the penetrating chest patients, how are we going to identify the tamponade patients? Because they're going to die. In other words, it's a double-edged sword. Some patients might bleed more and do worse, but all of the tamponades are going to die, and the tamponades, to me, are viable. All right, what about colloids? Let's do the colloid issue next. We got a bunch of papers here, you right? You got a bunch of colloid choices like dextran, albumin, head of starch, there's some others. This literature is very messy because the people who are patenting the dextran and the head of starch and the things all have different, you know, dextran 70, head of starch 160.5, you know, they all got their products that they're trying to push. And so it's hard to know what you're comparing to each thing. But the good news is you don't need to know. It's a messy literature, but you don't need to know. So let's go to abstract 19 from Canada, McMaster's University Review of 17 trials, 814 adults, five papers in trauma, nine in cardiovascular disease, three in ICU. And what they found is, is that when you use colloids for all the reasons you think you should, right, it's going to cause less brain swelling, less pulmonary edema. These patients with low albumins and oncotic pressures are going to do better when you give them colloids. No. No, no difference in pulmonary edema, no difference in resuscitation time, no difference in mortality, no difference in length of stay. Abstract 20, reviewed seven trials, same thing. Abstract 21 is an uh, ICU study of 7,000 patients in Australia and New Zealand. No. <coughs> Abstract 22 looks at blunt head trauma and intracranial pressure and says, you know what, this colloid stuff, they, they deal with all the fluids in Abstract 22, but they say that albumin and dextran not only are they not good, but they're antiplatelet, they cost a lot, and they have some attenuation of coagulation parameters. And so, and by the way, the Cochrane analysis, when they looked specifically at albumin and sick medical patients, said not only is it expensive, but people will die about 6% more on average. So about 1 in 17 will die. So you can spend a lot of money and kill people with colloids. And so basically, colloids right now have no role in the resuscitation of any medical patient or any trauma patient in the emergency department. No role. The, there is room, if you read the Cochrane or you read Abstract 20, they say, listen, this, this, the quality of this data to say that, as I just did, is a little weak. So there's probably still a role for research trials looking at various colloidal uh, solutions. So if you want to do a research project and get it through your institutional review board on albumin or dextran or things like that, feel free. But in terms of routine usage, there is not one author that has looked at this systematically that says there is an iota or shred of evidence to use colloids routinely, even on hypoalbuminemic liver patients, which we see a lot of. We got people with, we got, the, we got a whole bunch of pregnant men with the blue spider on their stomach and the, you know, we, we have to tap them five, six liters every, every couple of weeks. Even in that setting where you think, well, what they need is something that will stay in the blood vessels because they got no albumin, doesn't work. Doesn't make them do better. Abstract 22, just to go back to it, that's the paper that I think is important to look at because most of the papers that love lactated ringers call it isotonic. 
lactated ringers is not isotonic. And 22 is the paper that actually gets into that a little bit and points out that lactated ringers is indeed hypotonic and is indeed bad in head injured patients. All right, the next question. So we, I think it's pretty clear for me, and it's not my opinion, it's really what the literature says. Colloids, dead. Lactated ringers, I don't think it's the right thing. I think normal saline is probably where you want to start. You want to do the permissive hyper, uh, uh, hypotension thing on penetrating chest trauma, feel free. The next question is maybe we shouldn't be using normal saline but hypertonic saline. So who is first interested in the hypertonic saline? It was the military people at Walter Reed and the Brook uh, Institute, Brook Hospital. What is the military Brook one? Brook Army Medical Center. And the reason they were interested in hypertonic sailing was because in the Vietnam War, they found out when there were 20 guys shot up and every one of them needed a two liter resuscitation that the medic would be running out onto the battlefield with a wheelbarrow filled with saline. It was like, how are you gonna get all that salt water into the field? It was a real logistic problem. So they said, wait a minute, 250 cc's of 7.5% saline is the equivalent resuscitation to two liters of normal saline. So why don't we just put on every soldier's belt a little 250 cc bag of normal saline and every soldier will be toting their own resuscitation fluid and it'll be great as long as they don't get shot in the bag. And everyone will be resuscitatable. And so they started looking at it and it turns out that the fluid shifts, when you put the hypertonic saline in, the fluid shifts are amazingly fast. In 10 to 15 minutes, these fluid shifts, so it's not any slower than any other resus. And so there's a bunch of papers on it, but the un most unfortunate thing, animal literature, very favorable. You got a head injury. Should be beautiful, right? Because we're going to suck fluid off the brain while we resuscitate the periphery. Should be perfect. Animal literature on the topic, great. Everything looked, all systems go, and then the Australians blew it. Paper number 23, Cooper. Beautiful study done tried to answer in a prospective fashion, looked at hypertonic saline in head injured, multi-system trauma patients, high injury severity scores. In other words, you want this to be a sick population because you want to find benefit in survivorship. You want your main outcome, which is survivorship, to show benefit. So you would like to have it. They really optimally chose a population that should have shown benefit. Bummer, didn't work. 229 blunt handed injured patients, hypotensive, GCS roughly four, got their 7.5% versus lactated ringers. Ouch, how could you give that to a head injured patient? No survival, out, uh, no outcome change, no neurostats, really just didn't work. So the question is, did abstract 23 kill all the momentum for hypertonic saline? I don't think it did, and very, it's pretty unusual in medicine for one paper to bash a whole movement and so there has been quite a profound movement towards hypertonic saline. This paper does make it substantially harder to buy into it as a routine approach right now. Now, the critics of this paper say, come on, they were too sick. Now, I said that when you're doing a study, you wanted to pick a sick population to find a survivor difference. But the people who've looked at this said, come on. That what they did here was look at 7.5% normal saline in corpses. Of course there was no difference in survivorship, everyone died. Because when you look at it, they were shocky with a mean GCS of four. Think about that, GCS of four in shock from trauma, that is pretty much a dead thing. So that criticism might be valid of this study that maybe there still is a very important subset that would do better. Abstract 24 looks at lactated ringers versus hypertonic saline and says that hypertonic saline is better but really doesn't have much to go on. Abstract 25 is an important one because you'll see this all the time. It's dextran plus hypertonic saline. Why would they do that? Salt. When the salt works, it'll make the thing you patented, which doesn't work, look good. And so you'll see that all the time, the mixing of, of dextran with hypertonic saline in various formations. What the drug company is doing is I just told you that none, there's no indication for dextran or any of these things, so they try to tag it with something that works. Abstract 26 is a Brazilian look at hypertonic saline. It says it works great. By the way, dextran 70 was added and added nothing in that paper. Abstract 27 says it's beneficial. Um, this is an army study and it helped with intracranial pressure. Abstract 28 found improved survival. That's a meta-analysis of six prior trials in human trauma victims. So abstract 28 is the most positive counter to paper 23. So 23 is a human trial, Australian, well done, prospective negative. Abstract 28, not as good a methodology, very positive 
human trial as well. So those are the two rivaling papers. So you're going to hear more about it. And abstract 29 is an important paper because one of the other things you want to know, when you have a therapy that may or may not be better than the existing therapies, then you've got to ask one more question. Is there a downside to that therapy? So for example, in spinal cord injury, right? We said we're going to give this high dose steroid because there's no downside. Eh. Bracken was wrong. There's a huge downside to high-dose steroids, which is why many countries have refused to do this high-dose steroid nonsense in spinal cord injury. You put someone on high-dose steroids, they get twice the GI bleed, two times the PE rate, all kinds of other problems. And so it's not a free shot. High-dose steroids in spinal cord injury is not a free shot. And so abstract 29 asks the same question regarding hypertonic saline. Is hypertonic saline a free shot? Are there people and problems associated with it? And by the way, I've personally searched this literature exhaustively looking for any author that would say they got a problem with hypertonic saline. Whether it's a renal guy, an endocrine person, some researcher in any field, everyone thinks it's great. There's no downside that's ever come up with this. And so it appears to currently be a free shot. And finally, the last paper, switching gears to medical resus is Manny Rivers, all of you know the paper, early goal-directed therapy, just said that if you actually gathered the data and pushed your resuscitation to meet specified endpoints, that you would do a lot better in sepsis patients, survival would increase substantially. What's the fluid of choice? Normal saline. What's the main criticism? We don't give enough. We don't meet the goals that were set out. And so if you let ER docs kind of run and cycle as they will without anyone looking over their shoulder, we tend to give two to three liters. When you follow Manny Rivers' deal, you tend to give five to seven liters because you're pushing yourself further using these endpoints. And normal saline is, is, what, is what's pushed. I would say our intent to this now say, don't even call us and say, six liters. You know, when you get to six liters, then let us know. So it's, I, I agree, because we used to give like two liters to a little old nursing home patient. Like, oh my God, you know, back, well, now it's six liters. And so that's sort of a, an overall look at fluids. On balance, I'm interested in hypertonic saline. There may be more to learn. I'm not that interested in permissive hypercapnia unless you've got penetrating chest trauma, uh, permissive hypotension, unless you have penetrating chest trauma. I think dextran and all those colloid things are useless. And lactated ringers um, should only be given to surgeons um, when they have head injuries. Thank you.